Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode of Life Support. If you enjoy the content, we would ask that you like it, hit subscribe, and share it with your friends. So glad you're with us on Life Support. And this is a a podcast where we hope that you can find a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ through suffering and trauma, because we understand that suffering and trauma are going to be a part of this fallen world. But Jesus is still there, and we tell stories to help you find him. And my guest is a a very special guest today, Colleen Swindell-Thompson, who joins us from beautiful Texas. Hello. Hi there. Very good to have you. And we talked a little bit last week or last time about your background, and you explained that, yes, you are Chuck Swindell's daughter and had wonderful things to say about him and, and so forth. But Your story that you tell on Reframing Ministries is a ministry that we'll talk about in a a few minutes, but it's really a story that's difficult, but it's why you're with us, because you have discovered Jesus in suffering. So last time we talked a little bit about the suffering that your son went through and some of the difficulties of watching him go through that and how you found hope in Christ and, and what the Father watched him go through. But what about your own suffering, Colleen? You, you, you've been through so much from um, accidents and, and marriage issues that were just very, very painful. Can you kind of just give us a kind of a recap of some of the things that you've encountered in, in this crazy life? Yes. So um, I was not, not a wise self-care caregiver. And that's very typical as a caregiver. I tend, I put off going to appointments and doctors and, and my own just regular checkups. And what I didn't realize over time, even though I had evaluations every so often, I didn't really pay attention to them because I didn't have time to read through all the paperwork. Well, had I done that ahead of time, I would have seen that my back was out of alignment and there were some very serious issues that I didn't attend to. And it was in 2015 when within about three weeks, I wasn't able to walk because of pain in my spine and down my legs. And I realized, or I was told by a physician, you have to have immediate back surgery. It was the most painful surgery. And they say it is one of the most painful surgeries that you can have where they cut you open in the back and in the front and do a lot of stuff to put your spine back together the way it's supposed to be. It takes two years for that to heal. And that was the most excruciating physical suffering that I had gone through at that time. Emotional suffering happened with the decline of relationships, going through a really tough divorce. Nobody walks down the aisle saying, oh, this is going to end in divorce. So every event, whether it be physical or emotional or relational, it just, it, it undoes us in ways. And it creates then space for the Lord to begin his work if we are open to that. I will say there are times still that I just say, Lord, I can't, I can't keep doing this. This is, it is so hard because I had another spine surgery last year, five level neck surgery where they went into the back and then through the front, put in all these discs and that continues with other conditions, autoimmune disorders, arthritis. Just found out yesterday I have two more surgeries this year. Didn't even know that until this week. So I thought, I said to the Lord again, Lord, I, I'm so mad right now. <laughs> why is this happening? Not why, because I know why is, I wouldn't be happy with the answer anyways. I still have to do it. But it's for a better purpose. And I know that now looking back on the surgeries I've had and how extensive the healing process has been, I have seen his hand. And what I love about that is Deuteronomy talks about remember, remember, remember. Moses is telling the people, look back, remember all the ways, Deuteronomy 8, 2, remember the ways I led you through the wilderness for these 40 years to humble you, which Every one of the things I've gone through has been so humbling to test you and testing is part of suffering to see if I could trust you. And that is the purpose. That's, I cling to that verse when I am faced with something hard, Lord, you are humbling me. You are testing me and I want to be proven trustworthy by you. That helps me move forward, but let's forget 
when they got to the promised land, they did face the big wall and Joshua was encouraged, march into the land, but there were still walls. It doesn't mean that everything, once we feel better or have relationships repaired or renewed or have other people in our lives, that everything's going to be fine from here on out. So I am a big believer in creating little, memorable, visible things, whether it be rocks that I collect when I go visit my daughter or when we go hiking, or it's um, if I have a wonderful dinner with some new friends and we have had a glass of wine, I'll keep the cork and put it in a special place because I want to remember the way that the Lord has graced me by bringing new people, new places into my life that I wouldn't have ever had before if I had gone, not gone through what he allowed. Yeah, and in your case, it's not like you went into this physical arena all fit and super healthy emotionally and ready to go, and I can take on anything, because you'd already been through so much before you even entered this sphere. I, I thought I was. I used to run six miles a day. I loved working out. I love physical fitness. It's, I have ADD, so it helps with that. So I, I worked really hard at that because it was enjoyable for me. But time will catch up. And just like it is with our souls, if we do not check in with our souls and feed our souls, then we run out of what God wants to put in there. And again, we can't give what we don't have. So our physical body is just as important as to maintain a sense of connectedness to, am I resting enough? Am I sleeping enough? Am I getting enough water? Am I breathing well? Am I being present? Am I distracted? If I'm distracted, why am I distracted? Those are all really good things to examine because we need to stay in touch with body, soul, mind, and spirit. Yeah, my wife will tell you I'm distracted pretty much 24-7. So that's something I'm going to take to heart. What was the moment that you came to? Do you remember the moment when you said, God, I cannot do this anymore? And do you remember the ramifications of that and how that changed your life? Oh, I, I have had more than one moment. <laughs> I have that sometimes to this day. I think that's just living in this side of, on the side of heaven. Um, but yes, the first time I just let him have it was driving back in 2006 from the appointment with a doctor at Chalk Hospital in Southern California. And Jonathan had just been diagnosed with about seven or eight more disabilities. And she had looked at me and said, you're going to be raising, he's like the work of 10 kids. And I was already so exhausted and I was so mad because I thought I've done all this stuff, Lord, and this is the re this is what happened. So I just drove in my car and told him everything I was feeling. What we think the Lord will do is walk away. No, he he was like, keep it coming. I know that's what you're going through. When we get honest, when we share openly, authentically with the one who created us, first his arms are open. He never leaves us or forsakes us. His love is unending. We have to cling to that because that's, that provides the safe place for us to then express the emotions that we have. And again, emotions are just emotions. It's what we do with them that makes or breaks us. And I've chosen to take these experiences. Just last week was really working through a tough thing with Jonathan. And I was like, Lord, I can't, I cannot do this. And I realized he just was calling me to stop trying. Sometimes stop and being still so we can see what he will bring in is what he's longing for us to do. It creates those still quiet moments for him to speak to us. So instead of running from that now and just saying, forget it, Lord, I run to him and say, I, I can't do it. In fact, I think just today, I wrote a thing on I'm not adulting anymore as a caregiver. Excuse me, I'm going to get a drink of water. And I realized when I was writing this, how many things I do because I want to be responsible, but also I'm controlling. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, Colleen, you're not in control of how Jonathan turns out overall, meaning I, don't, I didn't create him. 
the Lord entrusted him to my to me, just like he did with my other two kids. So I have to go behind the behavior and what is the motivation. And that's where the Lord's really wanting to get into our hearts. When you talk about honesty with God, I always think of David. And uh, last time I was in Israel, they, they've excavated what they believe is his palace uh, in the old city. So I remember kind of walking uh, to that spot and looking out over this area that would have been Jerusalem then. And my guess is David probably wasn't a super fun-loving, like just happy-go-lucky guy. Now, I, I, I'm old enough to have almost been there, but I wasn't, so I didn't know David. But I do know that his writing was deeply honest from his heart. He was a very imperfect man in so many different ways. But yet, God used him remarkably. And so he ran toward God, just like you said, not away from God. And then he found God there waiting for him. So how does someone who's listening right now, Colleen, learn to embrace God in the dark moments? Because we all have them, whether we want to admit it or not. We do. We've had a, a lot of that has come out in this last year through the pandemic, which I, I am so it was such a tragedy to go through all that. But the good thing is that people have started to get more honest. Um, I think the church needs a paradigm shift, honestly. If we look at the disciples, the closest friends that Jesus had, they were so imperfect. I mean, I love it that David's in the Bible because he is so a man after God's own heart is what Jesus says about him. And yet, yeah, he was completely imperfect. The people that Jesus was close to were not the ones that were probably on the front rows of the church. In fact, Matthew, a tax collector, they were not allowed in the synagogue and they weren't allowed in any judicial system whatsoever. I mean, that's one of his best buddies, if we think about it. So we need a, a shift from this external having it all together to look who Jesus used. He called Jeremiah, who did the prophet's work, was beaten, put in jail, not one convert for over 40 years, the church today would probably fire him after a couple of years saying, you're not getting enough people. But God was using him. And look at Moses. Moses led the people to the promised land. Very, very human person, a murderer. So we got to get to these stories and look at the people God wrote about and has for us to look at and, and learn from. And once we do that, we see there's a book of Lamentations that speaks to the suffering heart that was written by a man who suffered so much inside of, there's a, there's a, there's a treasure inside the suffering that God allows us to go through. And it comes from his hand. It's getting to know him better. He brings us to people who reach into our hearts like we would never have had before had we not gone through experiences. In fact, one of the doctors that I have had went through a divorce and I was able at an appointment to, usually we don't, doctors don't talk more personally, but because I have so many of them and I see them all the time, I get to know them. And just said, I'm just really, really sorry that you're going through that and want you to know I care and I understand. Just hearing that alone makes it a little bit easier for the rest of the day. Yeah, well, you have the credibility because you've been through stuff. You know what it's like to go through things. And so many times in the church, we just throw out these platitudes that mean nothing. And then what happens is people just go hide because it's too hard to deal with all those platitudes. And I think to just say, I'm with you, I'm here you can't make it better, right? Isn't that what Jesus does with us? It's, he, he's not with me like sitting here uh, physically, but I know his presence is here. And um, yeah, I didn't go to church for two years, honestly, because I was tired of the looks, the judgment, the, the oh, God won't give you more than you can. The, oh, yeah. 
completely incorrectly stated verses. And I think what I would encourage people in the church, not that they are meaning to be rude or, or offensive, but just show up. You don't have to say anything. And if you do, it can be, how can I help you? Because nobody knows what I went through that morning before church. And I don't know what they went through that morning before church. I don't know if they've had a diagnosis or if there's been something that's happened. None of my words will change their diagnosis. But telling them that I'm here, that I will be sending a house cleaning service that will show up for a month as they start chemo, that is walking with someone through their suffering. And it's amazing how many of the daily needs we can help each other meet when we step into another's life that way, without judgment, just how can I care for you and love you through this? Because that's what Jesus does with all of us. Yes, he does. And he didn't get that same treatment by the disciples. And this has been going on for a long time because those men didn't exactly do a good job of uh, standing by the Lord in that moment of darkness. And they were afraid and they didn't want to step into all of that. So it's not just now. It's always been this way. And it's a, it's a battle of the heart. It's a battle against the enemy. And it, like you said before, it's really about who's in control. And I think it's about what we value, really. It's what it comes down to. Yeah. I, you know, I've been realizing more lately um, as I have been reviewing some of my core values and the ministry core values that most decisions, the best decisions that I make come from a place of those core foundational values not on emotion, not on a reaction, but when I've stopped, allow the Lord to calm me down a little bit because I can be such a little fireball <laughs> and then let him speak into my heart and then move forward. And it can be scary. I'm not going to say it's easy to step into something we don't understand. I didn't know anyone who had a disability or a disabled child when John was diagnosed. So I was really uncomfortable with the whole world of disabilities and probably was that person who said the wrong thing. That's another piece of the humbling process. And the Lord certainly has done a good job with that because now I love being around people with disabilities or challenges or whatever. They're so real, so honest, and it's refreshing for our churches to become that way, to me, is an exciting thought. And I think that can happen. I do too. Tell me about reframing ministries and what you're trying to do there and what led to the beginning of that ministry. So reframing started as I was realizing more and more people besides just people with disabilities, but more and more people are really hurting and my own physical pain and suffering added to that. And I thought, I've got to figure out a way to, it's really a psychological term, reframing. And it's just looking at life through a different perspective. And a lot of times we're just looking at that closed door, that big wall, and behind us is an opening. But if we stay looking at the frustration or the suffering or the problem and don't stop and say, okay, Lord, shift my focus, then we're going to miss what he, he's wanting us to see. So it's a shift in focus. And that's what I've had to do physically after surgeries, not being able to run anymore. How do I exercise and, and stay as healthy as possible? How, how do I move forward? We see it all the time when someone uh, has a stroke or ends up in a wheelchair, they've got to figure out life about three feet lower than what they had before. And so reframing really is a process of learning to accept what the Lord has allowed, go through the process of being humbled, being broken, being willing to admit areas of pride, um, and then allowing the Lord, his word, the people he brings into our lives to speak truth into our hearts to really change us. It's, it's another word to me for transformation. And that is a lifelong process for each one of us. So it's a, it's a valley and then a hill and a valley and a hill and it never ends. So reframing really came out of my own struggles to figure out how am I gonna do life well as a single parent and then in a blended family with two other step siblings and a husband, how do we do this thing called life together well? 
we got to sh shift our perspective a lot of times. We got to look in different ways and get really creative, strategically think, be a problem solver. That's what I want to teach through reframing. So we have the site, reframingministries.com is where you can find us. I do weekly articles or interviews, um, a lot of resource support, a lot of interaction online, a weekly live, Facebook live at one o'clock on Tuesdays, which is so fun. And it's just a short little boost that, that hopefully gives someone something to cling to if they're having a bad day or that they can pass it along to someone else. It's a voice that says, I understand you. Here's what happened this last week that just threw me off. So we're just very real. And I, I just invite anyone who has suffered, is suffering, or will suffer. Yeah, that's really good, Colleen. And I think that we all know what that's like to maybe feel like we just don't have anything left in the tank. And so what you're doing is you're giving people hope. And I really appreciate you doing that. So again, it's reframing.com. And there you go. And uh, on that front page, you've got a, a beautiful story there. And if you really want to really view Colleen's story in, in, at the whole, go to her website and you'll be able to see God work through amazing ways, a lot of it through tears. But that's where God does his greatest work uh, many times. So I really appreciate you sharing. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here and to be able to share and, and hopefully encourage someone today.